I a little bit overwhelmed by the, how many people are here, including some of my old friends uh, that I used to work with at Vanguard Supreme in Monroe. And as you probably know, today is Yom HaShoah Day. Yom HaShoah is, is the Hebrew word for Holocaust. Uh, today we commemorate the six million Jews who were murdered by the Nazis. Now, I'm going to be telling you my story of what it was like for a Jewish child to grow up, to grow up in, in Nazi Germany. I was born in uh, Dortmund, Germany. Dortmund is an industrial city uh, with a population of about 600,000 people. My parents were middle class, and my father was an accountant, and my mother was a homemaker, and I had a younger sister by the name of Sylvia. We lived in a small uh, apartment house, which was owned by my grandmother, aunt and uncle, and uh, cousins, who also had apartments in the same, in the same uh, house. Uh, life was good for us, that is, until January of 1933. In January of 1933, when I was six and a half years old, the Nazi party won the national election in Germany and Adolf Hitler became the Chancellor of Germany. Now Hitler, during the election campaign, and many years before that, promised that if he were elected, he would bring jobs to the unemployed, he would abrogate the uh, Versailles Treaty, and he would rid Germany of his Jews. He hated the Jewish people. He blamed the Germans of Jewish faith for all of Germany's problems, including the recession. Jews had lived in Germany for over a thousand years, had full citizenship, served bravely in the armed forces of Germany during World War I, but now if he were elected, he would get rid of the Jewish people. Right after Hitler came to power, groups of Nazi hoodlums wearing brown uniforms and wearing swastika armbands drove around, in, in, around the city in open trucks and they would grab any Jewish men they could find on the streets and beat them up for no other reason than they were Jewish. Jewish students could no longer attend uh, public schools, and I had to attend a uh, segregated school that was run by the Jewish community of, of, of Dortmund. Higher education, such as high schools and uh, universities, were no longer available to Jewish students. Then the Nazis went around the city and they painted on the uh, uh, front of Jewish businesses, this is a Jewish business, Germans do not pat patronize this business. The Nazis then passed a number of, Ju of laws known as the Nuremberg Laws. These laws restricted the civil rights of Jews and also the, um, restricted the occupations that Jewish uh, people could practice. For instance, Jews who were civil servants all, all lost their jobs. And in general, these laws made life for us very difficult. I was spat on while walking on the street. I was called a dirty Jew. I was beaten up by other kids, many of them older than I. And there was nothing that we could do about the beatings and all the other indignities we, which we were subjected to. And since we had to go to a Jewish school, the Nazi Hitler youth knew where to find us. And they would wait for us when we got out of school and beat us up. I used to try different routes going home, and I became a very good runner. <laughs> Nobody ever tried to help me or to uh, interfere with the, uh, with the hoodlums, uh, what they were doing to us, other than to call us dirty Jew, get out of Germany. Now we would have left, except for the fact that no country in the world would let us in. Not France or England, Holland, Belgium, South America, Palestine, which was under British control at that time, and even the United States. The United States at the time had a very uh, uh, strict uh, quota system and allowed, that allowed only a small number of immigrants to enter the United States each year. Shortly after Hitler came to power, my father went to the American consulate in uh, Stuttgart and registered for a quota number 
for immigration to the United States. In addition to the quota number, if it came up, you had to have a uh, sponsor in the United States who would furnish an affidavit saying that he would guarantee that the immigrant uh, would not become a public burden. Considering the fact that the, quota, uh, the number of quota visas that were issued each year was very small, and the ability to find a sponsor who would uh, uh, guarantee the, uh, that the immigrant would not become a public burden uh, was very difficult. Not many people were able to leave for the United States. I enjoyed playing soccer. Soccer was a very popular sport in Germany. And we would go to an open field that was near us and pl play soccer, or try to play soccer. Always on the lookout to see if anybody was coming to, the, the, to break up our game and to beat us up before we had a chance to run away. Under Jewish dietary laws, we are required to eat kosher food, particularly meat. The Nazis then passed a law that kosher meat was forbidden. There was a kosher butcher store across the street from where we lived, and one day I saw a bunch of Nazis enter the store, and they dragged the owner, Mr. Rosenfeld, out into the street. They beat him up, and then they set his beard on fire. Every day, whenever anybody left the house, one was always afraid of what would happen on the street and if you would get home safely. Not that you were really safe in your own home. Sometime in 1936, we were informed that we had to get out of the school building that we were t uh, attending. The building was ne needed for the Hitler Youth. Our school was uh, then had to move in an, into an old abandoned school building, which was much smaller, and we had to uh, go to double sessions. Then new laws were passed. Jews could no longer to be treated uh, by non-Jewish doctors. Unfortunately, there weren't many Jewish doctors in Dortmund, and some had managed to leave Germany. Now, initially, we thought that the Nazis would respect the Jewish uh, war veterans who had served in the German army during World War I. Now, these veterans had an organization called the Jewish War Veterans of Soldiers who served in the, on the front line. And in Dortmund, these veterans had a club and sports facility. And we used these facilities, and while in there, felt some measure of security. However, sometime in 1936, the Nazis closed the facility. Now you have to remember that uh, prior to uh, Hitler and World War I, some uh, 100,000 Jewish men served in the armed forces of, of, uh, of Germany, and 12,000 of them gave their lives for the fatherland. But now, uh, there was no room for them anymore in Germany. One Sunday, my father took uh, me to, uh, to see an operetta. When we got to the uh, concert hall, we found a sign that said, uh, Juden verboten, which meant Jews not allowed. New laws had been passed. Jews could no longer attend concerts, movies, or any public uh, uh, facility functions. All parks and recreation facilities were closed to Jews. My father, uh, as an accountant, worked for a number of Jewish-owned firms. In 1938, a new law was passed. Jews could no longer own a business. All businesses had to be sold to Aryans. The law said sold, but in fact, the Jewish owners did not receive any money. The money went to the Nazi party. Two of the businesses my father's worked for were owned by cousins of my father. And they both manufactured and sold men's suits and coats. And one day, a Nazi came to the office and told my cousin that he was buying his business. My cousin told him, OK, uh, he had no choice. And he told him, just give me a little time uh, to take care of a few things, and then the business is yours. The Nazi left. My cousin wasn't about to hand over uh, his life's uh, work uh, to the Nazis and give it all to the Nazis. And he immediately st uh, stopped production and started to liquidate the inventory. A short time later, the Nazi came back. And when he walked in, he said to my cousin, what is going on here? My cousin gave him some story. And when the Nazi left, my cousin, his wife, and daughter immediately left. They went to Cologne. From there, hired a smuggler who smuggled them into Belgium. And my father was in the office when all of this happened. And he came home and told the story to my mother, 
who said to my father, you must leave immediately because uh, you knew about what was going on there and you did not report it to the police. The Gestapo will now come and they will arrest you. And my father left immediately. I was 12 years old at the time. I had gone to school that morning. And when I came home from school, my father was gone. It was Thursday, September the 20th, 1938. When we got home from school, my mother got my sister and me together and told us we had to be brave, that Papa had to leave, that no matter what, we didn't know where Papa was, and we really didn't. That evening, my mother uh, collected all the photos that ha we had that had my father's uh, picture in them, and she burned them. She did not want the Gestapo to have a photo of my father, so that it would be more difficult for them to find him. In fact, my father went to a nearby city, Gelsenkirchen, where her first cousin lived, and spent the night there. And in the morning, my cousin, who had a car, drove him to uh, Cologne, where my father hired a smuggler who smuggled him into Belgium. The next morning, after my father had left, the Gestapo came to our house, and they wanted to know where my father was. And my mother told them that he had gone to work. When they told her that he wasn't there, she told them, then you must have him. What did you do to him? And my mother stuck to the story, and after a few weeks of, que after a few days of, uh, of questioning, they left us alone. Shortly thereafter, my sister was diagnosed to have diabetes. She needed medical, medical care and medication. There was only one Jewish doctor left in, in Dortmund, and medications were, were difficult to obtain because of all the restrictions they had put on us and our situation was getting very desperate. They lived in Germany, about 30,000 Jews who were Polish citizens, who had migrated to Germany from Poland to Germany at the beginning of the 20th century to escape anti-Semitic persecution in Poland and also for economic reasons. Without warning, on a Friday morning, October the 28th, 1938, at 5.30 in the morning, police knocked at our doors they were arresting all the Polish Jews who lived in Germany and deporting them to Poland. Early that morning, they took away my grandmother, aunt and uncle, and, and a number of cousins. They were allowed to take uh, uh, only the th things with them that they could carry. They were put on a train and deported to Poland, where they were brought to the Polish border and dropped off in an open field. I never saw my grandmother, uncle and aunts and cousins again they were all murdered by the Nazis. Among the people that were supported that day was a couple by the name of Greenspan. And, and the Greenspan had a son by the name of Her Herschel. And you probably uh, can see a picture. He's out in the, in the hallway. And one of the posters there, there's a, there's a little picture of a, a young fellow there. That's Her Herschel B uh, uh, Greenspan. He was about 17 or 18 years old. And he was going to school. He was living in Paris, France. And he was going to school there. And he was so incensed at what had happened to his, his parents who had been deported to Poland, that he took a gun, went to the German embassy, and shot the first secretary of the German embassy. The first secretary was severely wounded, and he succumbed to his wounds a day or two later, and died during the night of November uh, 9th, 8th. Now, we, we real, immediately realized that we were in big trouble. That morning, Joseph Goebbels, the propaganda minister, got on the radio and told the German people that the Jews must be punished for this crime. On the night of November 9, 10, 1938, millions of Germans took to the streets, and they burned all the synagogues in Germany. My sister and I had gone to bed to be awakened by terrible noises in the street. I got up and asked my mother what was going on, and she told me there were some drunks on the outside. I got up and peered up from behind the uh, curtains, and I could see that the synagogue a little further down the street was burning. And there were thousands of people out in the streets breaking windows, and there were people yelling, Judenraus and Judenverrecken, which meant out with the Jews and exterminate them. At that time, moment, I thought that I was going to die. They were going from house to house, apartment to apartment where Jewish people lived, as well as Jewish businesses, and smashing any glass, crystal, dishes, store windows, 
breaking up, uh, beating up Jewish men and taking many of them to concentration camps. During that night, they came into our house and a very kind and brave Christian woman who lived in our building in an apartment on the top floor went down and she met them downstairs and told them that we all had all been deported on October the 28th. And she showed them the uh, seals that the p uh, police had put on the apartments where my grandmother and aunt and uncle had lived. And they left. Around nine in the morning, they came back. And this time, they uh, came uh, into our apartment and they started to smash our dishes, crystal, cutting up our bedding, and beating up a friend who was in our apartment, knocking out his front teeth. Among the Nazis that came into the apartment was a policeman. My mother told the policeman, why are you allowing these people to do this to us? You are supposed to protect us. The policeman told, told her, you dirty Jew, we want you to get out of Germany. My mother then grabbed my sister and I and ran out of the house and, they went, we, and went to the police station and she demanded that they protect us. The policeman behind the desk said, okay, I'll put you in protective uh, uh, custody and he started to take a key out from, from along uh, from his desk. And uh, as soon as my mother saw that, she grabbed us by the hand and uh, ran out of the police station. People who were put in protective custody never came back. When we got home, the Nazis had left and our apartment was a big mess. There was broken glass, broken windows, the dishes were all, all uh, broken feathers from our bedding and our uh, belongings were strewn all over, all over the house. That night, the night of November 9th, 10th became known as Kristallnacht or Crystal Night. During that night, 91 Jewish men were murdered and 30,000 Jewish men were taken and, and uh, put into concentration camps. More than 300 synagogues were burned and destroyed. After Crystal Night, the Jewish community of Germany was fined 1 billion marks to pay for the damage. We were responsible for the damage. It was uh, the beginning of the Holocaust where 6 million Jews were murdered. Shortly after Crystal Night, a Nazi came to our house and told us that we had to get out of the house. He, he was a new owner. Where do we go? On January 1, 1939, uh, was New Year's Day, you know, it was on a Sunday. My mother uh, dressed my sister in warm clothing, packed a small suitcase, and bought a train ticket to Amsterdam, Holland for her. My sister was 10 years old and did not have a visa to go to Holland. My mother got out on the train and uh, with her and walking, uh, got on the train and, uh, and walking through the train asked people to take my sister to uh, Amsterdam. Fortunately, there was a kind, very kind Dutch woman on the train who had a daughter my sister's age, who was not with her, but who, who was noted in her passport. And she agreed to, she agreed to take my sister to, uh, and brought her to Amsterdam, where she turned over to the Jewish community of Amsterdam. My mother then went home, and she did the same thing with me, on Sunday, January the 15th, 1939, two weeks later. And I was 12 years old at the time. However, this time nobody on the train uh, would help us. When we got to the border, an SS man came on board to check the passport. He took my mother's passport from her and she had to get off the train. He allowed me to stay on even though I did not have a visa to go to Holland. After I crossed the border, the Dutch uh, border police came on board and I showed him my passport, which had no visa. He asked me where I was going. And I told him that I was going to visit my uncle in Amsterdam. He told me I was lying, and he was right. And he took me off the train, and I thought he was gonna send me back to Germany. The policeman had me sit on a bench on the uh, platform. It was very cold. And he brought me a cup of hot chocolate and a cheese sandwich, and he left and told me to, st to sit there. I sat there for several hours. In the meantime, two trains, two trains came by going back to Germany and um, they did not put me on these trains to send me back. After a while, the policeman came back and took me to a small hotel. Evidently, they weren't sending me back, at least not that night. I stayed in the hotel for, for two nights 
And then in the morning, a Jewish man from Arnheim came and took me to his home in, in the city of Arnheim. I stayed there overnight in his house, and in the morning he took me by train to a children's home in Weikansee, where, where, which is, what is on the coast of Holland, and, they, and there I found my sister. She stayed, and we stayed there for three months, and then we were sent to an orphanage in Amsterdam, where there were other children who had gotten there by kinder transport. I was in the orphanage till April of 1940. In the meantime, after I fled to Holland, my mother hired a smuggler to smuggle her into Belgium. She was caught by the Germans the, f uh, the first time and spent the night in jail, but made it uh, into Belgium on the second try. The quota number my father had registered for uh, in, at the American consulate in 1933 had come up, and he received a visa to come to the United States. He came to the United States in June of 1939. Once in the United States, my father found a sponsor for my mother, my sister, and myself, and we received our visa to come to the United States in March of 1940. We were reunited on April the 5th, 1940, as we boarded the ship that would take us uh, to the United States. And we left Rotterdam on April the 5th, 1940, and arrived in New York on April 17th, 1940. Now, the Germans invaded Holland, Belgium, and France on May the 10th, 1940, and we were probably on the last ship to leave Holland for the United States before the, the German invasion. Now, I returned to Europe exactly five years later, on April the 5th, 1945, when I passed through the Straits of Gibraltar on the United States troop ship USS Wakefield on the way, on the way to Italy as a soldier in the United States Army during World War II. And that is my story, and I'll be glad to answer any questions that you may have had. Thank you. Thank you for listening. What is that kind of transport? What kind of train system was that? Well, it was the regular, yeah, it was regular, regular trains. Um, the uh, British government uh, uh, decided that they were going to allow 10,000 children uh, to, to come in. One of our problems was uh, that in the beginning, Hitler just wanted to get the Jews out of Germany. And if you had a way of getting, going someplace, they let you out, no, no, no problem. Problem was, nobody would let us in. So uh, there were some people in, in, uh, in England that uh, uh, got the government to allow 10,000 children to, to be brought in. And uh, they, they, uh, these children were, came, went by train to, to the ports, and then they, they were, went to, uh, to uh, England. There was also regular trains, regular passenger trains. Yeah, any other questions? Yes, sir. When you came, over to, came to America, did y'all did get any news from Germany and Poland and where all the camps were? Did any news go to the United no, States about what no, was going on? No. Once, once the war started, uh, I received a letter from my grandmother um, just before, uh, before the, uh, the Germans invaded on September 1, and that was the, la that was the last uh, that, that I ever heard of her or any of my relatives, my aunts, uncles, cousins, and never heard, for, never she, heard of them. Was she in a camp then? Uh, at that point, well, no, the Germans invaded at that, that, uh, that point, and uh, at uh, uh, eventually, uh, she wound up. They wound up all in, in camps. Uh, um, some of them didn't stay very long in the camps. So the, the people that stayed in the camps were, were put to work. Uh, the people that were, were killed, uh, were murdered, uh, they, 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 they were brought to the uh, where the crematoriums were, and they were killed. Uh, at, at they got off the train, and they, they were ki killed immediately. They were, they were murdered. Ten thousand children that went to England. Mm -hmm. Were they all separated and put in um, orphanages? No, they were they were put into private homes. They were put into private homes in, in, in all, all over England. Wow, that's impressive. That's yeah. A yeah. Was there any support from American Jewry in terms of like an underground railroad to get you from Germany into America? There, there was no way of uh, of getting you in, 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 into America in those days. Uh, the, you know, uh, 
um, the borders were, were, were sealed uh, you know, and there weren't any planes flying here. You had to come by ship and, um, and there was no way of, uh, of uh, getting here illegally. And um, yes, uh, 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 Jewish organizations uh, uh, talked to the president and so on and so on and uh, uh, to no avail. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, there was a ship called the, uh, by the name of the St. Louis that uh, had some, I believe, some 600 uh, Jewish people who had, who had visas from Cuba. And they left uh, Hamburg, Germany, and uh, they went to Cuba. When they got to Cuba, uh, Castro at the time, uh, the uh, president, uh, uh, decided that he wasn't going to let them in, even though they had uh, legitimate visas and uh, they wouldn't let him into, uh, into Cuba. And the ship had to turn around, and the ship came uh, uh, off uh, Miami. And uh, Roosevelt ordered the United States Navy to intercept the ship, not to allow it to land, uh, because they were trying to uh, come to the United States. The United States wouldn't let him in, then they went off uh, to Canada. Canada wouldn't let him in. Eventually, the ship returned to uh, to Germany, and uh, eventually, all, most most of those people died in the, in the, in the concentration camps. No, 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 but nobody will let us in. Were the synagogues rebuilt in Germany, or were they one that the synagogues were rebuilt? Yeah, no, no, some of them were built. Yes, there were some were built. Uh, I, I happened to be in uh, in Hamburg, uh, 1949, I believe it was, uh, at a textile show and. Uh, it was a brand new synagogue which had been rebuilt by the, Ger by the German government. Yeah. So they were rebuilt. When you said you came back as a, an American soldier, did you see any action in World War II? No, I did not. I came, uh, I, I was 18 I, and I uh, arrived there uh, in, uh, in April of 19, uh, 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 1945. And uh, uh, and as, a, as a replacement, I went to a replacement center and uh, I was assigned to the 10th Mountain Division and they, they, they gave us uh, uh, two weeks of uh, training in climbing mountains. And uh, when we got finished, uh, the, the, the day that we finished and we got a pass, the war ended. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we, were, we were flown back to the States. We were supposed to go uh, for the invasion of Japan then we dropped the bomb, and then we stayed here in the States. Uh, what, what was over? Yeah, Bob Dole got shot there. Yeah, Bob Dole got was wounded. Yeah, Bob Dole was wounded in the 10th round. One last follow-up question. Would you have liked the opportunity to see action? Yes, I do. I do. Really? I thought you would. Yeah, I had, I had the opportunity of guarding some uh, German prisoners uh, after the war ended, and they weren't so tough. After, you know, no. all depend upon <laughs> which side you were on. The woman you married, did you marry a woman? Did, uh, yeah, I married when I came, uh, yeah, when American. I grew up here. Yeah. Is she Jewish? She's, no, yeah, of course, she's Jewish. And, she, was. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she was an American, she was American, she was born, she was born here. Oh. In New York? Would you yeah, in New York, we live in New York. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing your story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody, any, uh, any other questions? Uh, Yes. I was going to say that uh, Kinder transport was on 60 Minutes last night. Yes. Uh, and I think you can probably get it on the internet and see it again. Yeah, there's a story about uh, somebody who, uh, yeah. about an Englishman who very silently uh, brought, brought uh, without uh, any, uh, anybody know, really knowing about it, so I believe some 900 uh, children to, uh, to England. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was on last night. So in 1940, you came to the States. Yes. And your father came first. And My father came in 1939. 1939, okay. And you were separated from your mother. Yes. And you were with your sister. Yes. How in the world did your father, how was he able to find out where you and your sister were? You Good know, question. Or, but, uh, or we didn't. Was he able to have you all? On the same ship. Good, good, well, good, good question because uh, we didn't have any internet in those days. Right. <laughs> uh, we did it by mail. Um, you know, when my father fled uh, uh, f f first, 
and he wound up in Belgium. Uh, we didn't know for about two weeks whether he had gotten there or the, the Nazis had, had, had him because uh, the, the mail, and uh, then eventually we got mail from him that, that he, uh, he was in, in Antwerp. But that's how we knew. In the same way I, I, I corresponded uh, with my, my father and my mother in Belgium, and, uh, and, and then when he came to the United States uh, th through the, uh, th to the mail. So we, we corresponded uh, by mail. Was any mail ever read by the Nazis, if you will? Pardon? Any of the mail ever read? Oh, I'm sure that when, when, I'm sure when we were in Germany, uh, I think probably the reason that it took so long for the mail to, to get us, uh, they, they probably held it up. Uh, they, they probably held it up. And the, probably the reason that they, they left us alone, they, they, they probably knew that he, he, he had gotten a course. Did your father have relatives in the United States? Yes, uh, I had an uncle. My mother had a brother here. My mother had a brother here. But they were going to see each other. Do you know the reason why many countries didn't accept Jews? Anti-Semitism, pure and simple. So the, Ger the Germans didn't invent it. It was worldwide. Germans didn't invent it. I just wonder what led to this. Yeah, all the countries. All the countries. No, no, nobody would let us in. Nobody would let us in. The United States had isolation policy. The United States was the United States? The United States, the one, they had a, they had a, the, they had a, a quota system which was allowed only very few people to come in each, each year. And the quotas were particularly small for the Eastern Bloc countries where most of the Jews came, came from. So therefore, uh, not, not many people were able to come here. Nowadays, well, we have no quota system. Anybody can come here. Anybody can come here. <laughs> yep. Legal or illegal. Yeah. Yeah. Make any difference. Yeah. My father registered uh, the American Council in 1933. It took six years for the for a number to come up. No kidding. It took six years. So, well, it's not a lot. A lot of it was you. You, you got a number, and uh, you know when that number so came up, you, know, you had to stay, stay in the line till, till, the, till the number came up. Many more people could have been saved. Thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands could have been saved. But could have been saved if, uh, if other countries would have opened their borders, but they didn't. Were you able to help any other victims? Those that came out of the camps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, there was no opinion. No. Yes. Um, did you ever find your father? My father? Yes, I, in the United States, I found my father here. Yes. He met us when we when we arrived in uh, New York. He met us at the ship. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. You want to see something that was heartwarming? Bring it up on your computer. They interviewed this man who accomplished this. 104 years old. Yeah. Humble as can be. He never told anybody about that he did it. Right. Here's his picture right there. Yeah. That's the man. He 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 never he never told anybody that he did it. Yeah. And all of a sudden, they asked him, they asked the crowd, is there anybody in here who know this man? People rose up. He turned around. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. He saved, like you said, over 600 people, kids. They said that amounts to over 50,000 lives with the grandkids and all that. Story. Yeah, there were there were a few uh, stories like that. There was another one, uh, a Jewish man from Philadelphia. And the name I think was uh, I forgot the name. Uh, and he uh, he and his wife went to uh, uh, went to uh, Austria and Vienna, and they uh, they found out that there were uh, 
quota numbers that were available that our government, uh, that the, uh, the, our consulate weren't issuing them. And, uh, he, and he saved 50 children uh, with, with, with these quotas. Uh, uh, in, in many cases, uh, the, the, uh, the, the American consulates in, uh, in Europe uh, would not issue the, the, the small number of, of visas that were available uh, when they were issued. They weren't even used. People could have been saved, but they weren't. Did your family face uh, prejudice here in the United States when they came? Well, yeah, well, there, there was uh, anti-Semitism in the United States, uh, much more so than there is today. We're we a much different country here today uh, than we were in 19, 1940. Uh, I can tell you that I, uh, I had a hard time finding a job after, after I got out of the Army. Uh, many large companies wouldn't hire somebody that was Jewish. They, you know, you fill, fill out an application, they'll let you know. Other people got interviews, uh, didn't get an interview. Uh, I did get one job uh, shortly before uh, the, the Day of Atonement, and the Day of Atonement, of Atonement the, which is our holy, holiest day in the Jewish ca calendar. Um, we're not allowed to work, but we, we spent the day in the, in the synagogue. Uh, I told my supervisor that uh, I would have to take off a day off because of Yom Kippur. He told me, don't bother, come back. Did you go to school here in America? Yes. Did you go to school here? Yes, I did. I did. Where did you go? Uh, I went to school in, uh, in New York. I went to school. Uh, uh, well, I, I first had to f finish uh, uh, high school because uh, I hadn't gone to school for a year and a half. Uh, on Crystal Knock, but that was the last day I, I, I went to school until I came to the United States. So for a year and a half, I did not go to school. So after I got out of the Army, I first had to go, go and finish high school. And then I went to a, a college at Pratt Institute in, in Brooklyn. Right. Yeah. I'm from Brooklyn, New York, oh, yeah. so I know it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, down by the ele under the elevator? Yes, yes. Okay. Did your family stay in New York? Uh, yes. My, my, both my, my father my, passed away in New York, my mother too. They buried there. Yeah. Were you able to put behind you or your sister or your parents? <laughs> Yeah, you make a new. Uh, kind of it, it, it took a while, uh, you know, I, I had nightmares and, uh, and, and, but you make a new life and uh, life life goes on. Life goes on. Yes, ma'am. How does it does it worry you when you hear people today compare things to Hitler and Nazi Germany and the Holocaust? Well, it all it all depends. Sometimes uh, you know, you hear people just throwing around, you know, just like the the Holocaust or so forth and so on. Uh, I I think it's terrible. It's you know, people uh, compare that to to what happened there. I forget. There were six million people. You know, you, 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 if, if they were murdered for no other reason that they were Jewish. No other reason. You, you think of uh, the six million just a number, but. Take take one plus one plus one plus one. See how many um, how many how many people are six million, uh, uh, and uh, what it took for them to, to do that. Six million people to murder six million people, including 150 thousand, one million and a half children, one million uh, one million five hundred thousand children, including my first cousin. She was three years old. Mm -hmm. what, what what could she have done wrong? She was three years old. Anybody else? Well, I would like to thank you all for coming here to listen, and uh, I, I appreciate it. And um, thank you.